In this video, I'll show you how I strapped an E3D Hemera to a Tronx E3D printer to make one of the best 3D printers I've ever used. This is a combination I don't think anyone saw coming, but it's actually been a year in the making. Introducing the Tronxy D01 Phoenix Edition. Let's get started. Back at the end of 2019, the team at E3D got in touch with me about their hotly awaited extruder and hot end solution. And well, if you followed along at the time, then you know things didn't quite go smoothly for them. They were forced to change the name last minute and production was hit hard at the beginning of the global pandemic. Combine that with some early quality control issues and well, they politely asked me to hold off covering it on the channel. But now, one year later, the Hemera is ready to go, so I can finally discuss this. Who remembers this 3D printer? I reviewed the Tronxy D01 back in November 2019, and while I really liked the mechanical design, the Bowden extruder and hot end was a steaming pile of garbage, requiring humongous retraction settings to work at all. The icing on the cake, however, was when the hot end plug came loose and the printer went into thermal runaway, with no protections whatsoever. I came into the garage one morning greeted with a smell of burning PLA and this print, which had thankfully just about finished when the fault occurred. Needless to say, I was pretty furious because printers should have protections. So I publicly shamed Tronxy and forced them to rush out updated configuration files to enable thermal runaway and make this machine actually safe to use. Since then, however, it seems the page on their website has vanished and I have no idea if they even updated factory units. So they get a zero out of 10 for actually changing their behavior and keeping on top of things. So I've re-uploaded the configuration file personally and you can find it in the video description below. All of that said though, I really wanted to know just how good this machine could be with a proper decent extruder and hot end solution. So enter the E3D Hemera. At 90 British pounds plus VAT and shipping, the Hemera is a premium price extrusion system with a premium feel. Although expensive compared to many other solutions in the market, it does include both the extruder and hot end components, including the stepper motor, cables, and heat sink fan. The package is clean and compact and the cardboard boxes are much appreciated. Even Popeye enjoyed them. The extrusion system comes pre-assembled and has quite a bit of heft to it. It has a full-size NEMA 17 motor strapped to the back of it, and the design is actually quite complicated, with a single stage reduction of 3.32 to 1 of the step motor, which drives two hobbed gears meshed together with chunky mod 0.5 spur gears. E3D has kept this gear train compact by machining part of it straight into the face of the custom step motor. The motor also has these unusual T-slots which gives you a variety of mounting options, but does mean you're stuck with it. In my opinion, it's a bit of a shame because I feel with that reduction, you could get away with a pancake step motor and shave a lot of weight off the assembly, but no, you are stuck with this motor. E3D is also particularly proud of this custom heat sink, which is designed to throw air away from the printing area so as to not unintentionally cool prints. It looks really nice, but you don't even see it when you screw the heat sink fan in place, which is a shame. But hey, at least you still know it's there and not a boring heat sink, right? Especially if you use the provided sticker. I work a lot with super budget 3D printers and many of them actually work okay. But looking at the quality of machining on this heat break really does prove that your money is going towards better parts when you buy things like this extruder. The throat is just so damn thin and the whole thing is polished cleanly with zero burrs. It's beautifully machined. You also get a 0.4 millimeter brass nozzle included, but E3D also sent their nozzle X set to me along with the extruder. So I went with that nozzle instead. There is nothing wrong with using straight brass for everyday 3D printing, but if you want to print with abrasive filaments like carbon filled nylon, then brass will get destroyed almost instantly. Nozzle X is made from tool steel with a hard nickel plating. So it's going to be much harder wearing if I want to print with those abrasive materials. Assembly out of the box is fairly easy, but a little delicate. You thread the heat break into place and then the heater block. The trick is to get a tight seal between the heat break and nozzle while aligning the heat block to where you want it. I do this by slowly rotating into place and testing tension before gently tightening. Remember to never over tighten the delicate heat break because it'll just snap in half. 
You need to use two spanners on the nozzle and the heater block to do your tension and you will need to do a final tighten when the whole assembly is at printing temperature to make sure nothing leaks and it's all tight. It's a delicate process so take your time, watch some videos online and make sure you get it right because you don't want to snap that heat break. The heat cartridge clamps into place with an M3 screw and the heat sink cooling fan secures with two self-tapping screws which are provided. All right, so how do you attach this thing to the D01? Well, it's actually pretty simple and only required a few new holes to be drilled in the metal extruder mount and a few new parts printed. First, you need to remove the crappy existing hot end. I secured the cable with hot glue to try to avoid any additional failures after the thermal runaway incident, but it just unplugs and the Bowden tube should pull out too. But if it doesn't, just cut it off. We're done with it. It's pretty crazy to see how burnt the PTFE was. It just goes to show how dangerous Thermal Runaway really is. There's no excuses for a 3D printer not to have Thermal Runaway protection in place. The metal shroud is held in place with two screws, which once removed gives you access to the hot end. Again, just check out this molten PLA that's crept up through the poorly machined threads on the hot end. This is why you tighten the nozzle against the heat break. But this sort of thing can still happen with poor quality threads. Under the two remaining screws to remove it and well, chuck it in the bin. My machine had this LED strip zip tied in place under the hot end as well, which will get in the way slightly. So I got rid of it too. Finally, the brass standoffs for the hot end need to be removed, leaving the bracket bare and ready for modifications. I really wasn't sure if the Hemera would fit considering the D01 homes right up the front under the metal frame, but it does just clear, which is awesome. So doing this mod won't affect your already quite small build volume on the D01. It also just so happens there's already a hole ready to go, so I figured the easiest method of mounting would be to drill another one above it. I'm honestly so conflicted with this printer. On one hand, I'm disgusted by the disregard for safety, but on the other, I really like the use of linear rails. Once you pop them out free, the belts will flop off and hang loose. So try not to move them around too much as it's pretty challenging to attach them after. Getting that second hole drilled accurately is obviously pretty important. So I recommend a set square to line it up and mark the distance. A quick tip, by the way, this was all filmed with the pre-production Hemera before documentation was easily available. And I wanted to find out the distance between mounting holes. So what you do is you take your calipers and you measure one bore with the internal diameter. Then you reset the calipers to zero before measuring the total distance of the calipers and the number will be the correct center point measurement. It only works if both bores are the same size, but it's a mega handy trick. I learned it years ago and I use it all the time. Drilling out the hole was a little challenging because there needs to be both a hole on the opposite side for tightening. It also needs to be slightly countersunk to clear the linear rail. And I just did it in stages using slightly larger drill bits each time. The end result isn't super pretty, but it is fully functional. The most important hole, however, to get accurate is the 3.5 millimeters that butts up against the Homera hot end and mounts it in place. Reattaching the assembly to the printer and tensioning the belts is pretty fiddly, but it wasn't too bad. And with that, we are ready for wiring. Well, almost. The original hot end cover used to house the limit switch for the X axis, so that now needs to be replaced. And by far the easiest solution I came up with was to laser cut a little offset plate, which mounts above the extruder onto the linear rail carriage. And I did fine adjustments by just bending the micro switch arm slightly to make it home in the place I wanted. I'll share the DXF, STL and STP of this bracket and other parts I've used in the video description if you want to use it or modify it on your build. And with that done, we can make sure it's all wired up, give it a test, make sure it's extruding in the correct direction, and then we need to change the E-steps. So why Phoenix Edition? Well, because it very nearly rose from the ashes to become a capable addition to my workshop. I used this printer with the pre-production Hemera for quite a while. However, it did eventually start to have issues extruding. In early 2020, E3D started discovering faults with some of their Hemeras related to the gears and published a quick guide on how to check them. And unfortunately, the pre-production unit I had was suffering this issue along with a hairline crack on the pinion gear. I need to point out though, that's now all fixed. So if you have an early Hemera that's giving you issues, please do get in touch with them because they are all over it. Fitting the new hot end gave me a chance to tidy up my wiring too. And I'll be honest, my solution isn't the greatest. Wiring is my least favorite part of 3D printer building and maintenance as they always seem to be way too long or just a little bit too short. In this case, the homing position is really far from the control board and some existing wires were right at their limits already. 
So I ended up extending a few and then running them all through this really nice expanding orange mesh, which was pretty awful to work with, but the end result looks quite nice. It's still a little tight for my liking when it's homing, but during the prints, it seems fine. Finally, the printer needed a part cooling solution. This is one of the areas I think the Himera falls quite short. It's a well-designed and capable system, but E3D seems to have left the design of effective part cooling ducts largely to the community. While I understand that different printers will have different fans and need different solutions, it's a bit much to expect most enthusiasts, myself included, to design cooling ducts that A, actually work, and B, can be 3D printed successfully. I looked for ages and I ended up going with this excellent looking minimal design by Permanoob on Thingiverse that uses a 24 volt 5015 squirrel cage fan. Yeah, Permanoob by name alone, this design fitted perfectly and I like the adjustment points. I used this fan trout for all of my test prints and I'll link it in the video description. All right, so let's check out some of the prints I've done. I haven't done a huge amount since I've done the final modification with the latest E3 Hemera, but this is what I've got. And let's start with the most impressive, which is this Mayan Dice Tower by Kim on My Mini Factory. And Kim actually has a Kickstarter live right now with other Dice Towers. And I'm giving her a shout out because can I say this is one of the most impressively detailed models I've ever printed. Period. So this model took roughly 40 hours to print at 0.15 millimeter layer heights using Polyalchemy's FX line of filament, which is this really nice sort of stone rough textured material. Absolutely perfect for this sort of model. But the detail that's gone into this print is just insane. There's no flat surfaces anywhere on this model. It's incredibly detailed with bricks, stonework, skulls, and printed with no support material. It's absolutely incredible. Now, adding texture like this to models does usually help to hide print imperfections, but having a close look at it, other than some tiny little blobs where the PLA might have been a little bit moist, again, I'm having a lot of moisture issues with my filament right now, I really can't fault it. Some of the overhangs have been a bit too extreme, but really to print this with no support, especially these really steep cave entrances, just absolutely phenomenal. So yeah. Um, I really like this and my sister's into D&D right now, so this might well be the new dice tower for her campaigns. Next are some models that you're more familiar with on the channel, some 3D Benchies and some Gator Anderson Cats. Uh, let's start with 3D Benchies. So I recently showed a vacuum bag sealing system on the channel and I was testing PTG on this machine with no uh, cooling fan. So the smokestack on the benches I was printing was all melted and crap. Um, so this is the same G-code, identical same G-code, identical same filament, just with the final iteration with the cooling duct. And I'm gonna mostly focus on that smokestack because it is oh so clean. It just goes to show how a little bit of cooling goes a long way, even with filaments like PTG. Uh, and this is a really, really nice benchy. I did print with a brim to keep adhesion good. I also did one in white PLA and white PLA is like the worst filament for showing on camera because it just blows out any sort of detail. But I will say what I'm noticing with this setup is the heat bed has to be at 60 degrees for PLA to stick down or any sort of filaments to stick down. Anything lower than that is the filament will come away from the, the glass, uh, the ceramic glass plate. And that means that detailed PLA prints stay too soft. And I did notice with, for example, the torture lattice test, I did just a little bit, it really had to start to get further away from that heat bed before any sort of cooling could be achieved and any sort of steep overhangs could be achieved. And you can really see here, when it's too close to the heat bed, it's just so soft. As it starts to get away, it starts to get better. So I think for this machine, PLA isn't its strong suit. However, having said that, the Gay Anderson Cat in this silver cheap Hobby King PLA, 0.15 layers, is a really good result. Usually these legs tend to break off. This was done without any sort of brim or raft as well, which is again, quite impressive for this leg not to snap off. I tried a clearance cage, this is like one of my newer ones I've been working on. It prints quicker than the old versions. Uh, and it got down to 0.2 fine, but 0.15 is welded. And again, it's white, I apologize. But looking closely at it, the first few layers is where there seems to be a bit of inaccuracy. And I reckon it's because the PLA is just a bit too soft and that's probably where it's bound up. So yeah, it's probably not the best machine for small detailed PLA prints, but what about some higher temperature filaments? Well, I did try a TPU. This is Polymaker's new high speed TPU. And the Hemera had no issues printing this fast. I could have printed way faster than I did, but I was limited by the cooling near the print bed. Uh, it's, it definitely was still very soft for those first few layers with the overhangs being very poorly replicated. As it got higher, there is some stringing that's very common with flexible filaments. But interestingly enough, when I sliced this in Prusa Slicer, I made the spokes have no infill, and then I added some infill at the top just to allow the top 
uh, to fill in properly. And what I've noticed is when there was no infill, it's got stringing, but when it had to do that little infill towards the top, it kind of stopped it. There's a few blobs, but the, the long wispy strings didn't occur. Now I do have retraction on this setup. Himera's need very low retraction. I've gone between 0.5 and one millimeters retraction, but I think with uh, this flexible print, the secret is to have that little internal uh, sort of path that will help relieve the pressure and then it moves off and wipes and then you won't get these long wispy strings. But again, it's flexible filaments. It's kind of part of the game and you can just cut them away with a pair of scissors and it's really quite tough and flexible. So I'm gonna be using this filament quite a bit in the future. It's more flexible than I expected, especially considering how fast you can print it. But I'm really, really interested in printing super high performance materials on this machine like carbon fiber nylon, which is what these parts are. So these are printed in carbonite, which is a nylon carbon fiber blend from Rigid Ink. I was looking for the print settings for this on their website and I was disheartened to see that Rigid Ink no longer sells filaments. I don't know when that happened, but um, I'm sorry to hear that guys because uh, Rigid Ink were one of the first companies to ever send me filament to test on the channel. So best of luck with the future. But this filament, it's really rough. It's a really rough carbon fiber nylon, but it's great for functional prints. So these are clamps for my music setup. I've run out of, of holders for my gear, so I need to make more. Um, and it's designed to clamp onto the arm and hold some T-slot aluminium, which I can then use to make custom brackets and then hold more gear. And they printed really, really good with no stringing and a few little minor blobs that can be easily cleared away with a pair of side cutters. There are, of course, a fair few failures dialing this machine in. One, one notable example is this fish. Um, it's a Siamese fighting fish, again by Kim, who did the dice tower, and it just needed two, two delicate support towers, and they got knocked over by the hot end moving around. Um, and then it just knocked the whole print off the bed and I found a huge pile of spaghetti. So that one failed. And these ones are really interesting and I still don't know exactly why this happened. This is some filamentum PLA, normally really, really good. And the print quality is good, but it sort of uh, jammed up and failed to extrude at the same point. Um, and you can't really blame the, the print file because this is the same model, just in a different PLA. I'm not exactly sure what was going on there. If it was heat creep or the, the roll had too much resistance. Either way, they failed at almost exactly the same point as it got up to that support tower. Um, and I, when I swapped to the silver, it fixed it. Not exactly sure what was going on there. If anyone has any ideas, I'd love to hear in the comments. There was a few failures, but overall, this machine has proven really reliable, which is exactly what I need for a production level machine down in the workshop. Is the Himera the best solution out there for this kind of upgrade? Well, there's certainly competition. Unfortunately for E3D, in the time it took them to get production back up and running, BQ released the BQBX, which comes armed with an absolute cracker of a direct drive extruder, the H2. Instead of a NEMA 17, BQ went with a NEMA 14 and a larger reduction to bump up torque. The E-steps will have to be higher and more RPM means theoretically you'll lose torque earlier than with the Himera, but it only weighs 211 grams versus 388 grams. I did review the BQBX with this extruder in pre-production form and overall I quite liked it, but the 3D Printing General has a really good deep dive video in the extruder itself if you're interested in comparing. It's pretty clear looking at the heatsink that they're taking quite a lot of design cues from the Himera, but it's not a direct clone and it's not super cheap either at around $90 US. Another highly attractive upgrade option would be something like the Bontech DDX system, which is a bolt-in replacement for the Bowden style hot ends in Creality printers, which is also the one in the Tronxy here. I'm not sure if it would clear the front here on the DO1, but either way, you could use the original hot end or pair it up with a slice engineering copperhead for something pretty damn awesome. But you'll be looking at around $250 US plus shipping for the privilege, which makes the Himera seem quite an affordable upgrade in comparison. So there you have it, the DO1 Phoenix with the E3D Himera extruder and hot end. This thing so far has handled every filament I've thrown at it, and although the DO1's print volume is very small, it's resulted in a machine absolutely perfect for high quality functional models, ranging from TPU to PA12. The heat bed and cooling solution on it means PLA isn't the best quality on it, but I have tons of other PLA only printers, so I'm not really gonna be using it for that. However, I am terribly conflicted with this machine because I now really like this printer, but I'm still angry at Tronxy. But anyway, <laughs> if you do decide to pick up one of these machines or do modifications to it, then be sure to enable Thermal Runaway with a config below. And I've also shared my custom Prusa Slicer profile to show you how to get prints like this 
of this machine. Big thanks to E3D for sending not just one, but two Hemeras a year apart, free of charge for purpose of testing and review. This video has just been my own opinion and no money has changed hands. And you can find a non-affiliate purchase link in the description below. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please do leave a comment below. I'd love to see it and answer them for you. And if you found this video useful, then maybe perhaps I've earned your subscription because this build did take quite a long time and involved an awful lot of testing. Either way, I hope you found this video enjoyable and I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later guys, bye.